All right, uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good evening, and good night, depending on where we're all coming from. Uh, so I'm glad to see that we have such a great crowd, and thanks for, for coming today. Uh, so I'm really excited to be talking about one of my favorite uh, types of field techniques, which is uh, tracking bats. And so this is uh, the name of this webinar series is My Field for Dummies. So I've tried to turn this into more of a more of like a series of stories of, of the way that we are using really neat technologies in order to answer some some pretty cool questions uh, about bats, our, our favorite taxa for for today. Uh, so first, I wanted to start this off uh, with just acknowledging I'm going to be mentioning a lot of really cool research today, and I'm going to be trying to highlight the, the researchers that are behind it. So uh, so I wanted to just acknowledge that I'm going to be talking about a lot of interesting research today that's being conducted all across the world um, by some really amazing researchers. And of, of course, GBATnet for putting this webinar series on and my current university, University of Regina in Regina, Saskatchewan. And if you're interested in learning more about me and my research, you can find me on social media as I'm on TikTok and Instagram at iPatchBiologist. So a little bit uh, about me first real quick. So hello, my name is Dana, Dana Green, and I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri. So I grew up in the US and now I'm currently a resident of Saskatchewan, Canada. And I've had the privilege of studying all sorts of of different wildlife. Bats has been my main go-to when it comes to what I've been researching and working on. But I've also worked on salamanders, small mammals like uh, grasshopper mice, and I've also worked with things like armadillos uh, and even tigers. So uh, I've had a, a variety of experiences, but bats is what pulls my heartstrings. It's what I've uh, centered uh, my efforts on. And uh, I've been working with bats now for, for 10 years. So it's been quite some time. And then in my off time, I am an, uh, a falconer. So you can see on the top picture there, that's uh, me and my and my bird Eos out on a hunt today. And so she is a free flying bird and I do have like a little follow-up story about using radio telemetry with her. So you'll get a little taste of that uh, today as well. Okay, so kind of hopping right into it. Uh, I kind of wanted to just like, put a very like very broad stroke baseline. What is tracking? So tracking is going to be the science, and I did include the word art here because I do believe that tracking has a has an art form to it as well. So the science and art of observing animal signs with the goal of gaining an understanding of the landscape of the and the animal being tracked. Uh, so tracking can lead to deeper understandings of the systems and patterns of the wildlife. Uh, within the environment. So yes, it's it can be as simple as, as putting it as trying to find an animal, but there's a lot that goes into tracking, a lot of things that we're having to implement. We're, we're having to use multiple uh, multiples of our senses in order to be able to, get, uh, to understand where is the most likely uh, area that the animal is going to be going to, looking for different environmental characteristics. So it's much more complicated than just looking for an animal. Uh, and it's always going to change. It's always going to change depending on what you're looking for. The way one tracks a bat is not necessarily going to be the same way that tracks a mule deer or is going to be the same way that someone tracks a snake. So it's going to be incredibly different depending on the taxa that you're tracking. And you're gonna be looking for different things depending on that. So for tracking bats specifically, and this is practically 100% of what today's talk is going to be focused on because this is GBATnet. So we're all about bats here. Uh, so all of my examples today, except for one, is uh, gonna be about tracking bats. So this is going to be very much centered around that. And uh, <laughs> pretty much whenever I think about, okay, so tracking bats, what does that mean? It's, it's hard. It's incredibly difficult to track bats, but we love bats anyway, and we will continue to do it anyway, no matter how difficult it might be, because we love our bats. Uh, you can probably go to any any person that studies bats or is a bat ecologist or biologist, and, and we go head over heels for our little bat buddies. So it's incredibly difficult because bats are small. Most bats are very small. They're incredibly mobile. 
recaptures, uh, unlike uh, a lot of birds, recaptures are incredibly rare and they're nocturnal. So they're hard to find, hard to see, hard to get. Uh, so that makes all of this incredibly difficult. But we can answer some really, really important questions when it comes to being able to track bats. We can answer questions about uh, their roosting, uh, roosting characteristics, roosting habitat, what they require for maternity colonies to raise their pups, uh, what, what foraging areas they're using. So we can track bats and understand what areas are important for them for food resources, et cetera, how they're moving around the habitat, how they're using the landscape, uh, and even questions revolving around thermoregulation, which I will uh, get into in just a little bit, which uh, to break that word down, if you've never heard the term thermoregulation, thermo, thermal, referring to, to temperature and regulation. So this is all about how bats are regulating their body temperatures, which bats can hibernate. So they have some pretty incredible thermoregulation physiology ability. But there's some limitations. There's some limitations when it comes to studying bats because uh, we, have some, we have some rules when it comes to what we can uh, use for wildlife. So a lot of this is, is coming down to, for, for those really small bats, there's been this, this uh, unofficial yet kind of official, but still unofficial rule called the 5% rule, which is the, sadly, the 5% the rule actually stems from my current supervisor's research work it's it's uh he's he's not very happy how far how far this five percent rule has been taken and run with uh because he thinks it's been taken a little bit out of context but what the five percent rule says is that a bat can't have a um a tracker on it that is more than five percent of its total body mass uh so if you're some of the bats that I personally study can be six grams. Six grams is, is nothing, is nothing. We, we actually, we don't give those bats trackers at all because we don't have any tags that are small enough for them. Uh, and a lot of that is determined by the battery size uh, and the, the bigger the battery, the heavier it's gonna be. So we're limited. We're very limited on battery. Uh, so smaller batteries means lower battery charge, uh, lower battery life. And a lot of these, the batteries aren't gonna be rechargeable. And then bringing it back to the fact that bats are small, highly mobile, recaptures are incredibly rare and they're nocturnal. So tracking bats is hard. It's very difficult, but there's been um, ever since radio telemetry came around, started being implemented within bat research, uh, it's been, we've been answering some really, really incredible questions, even though the difficulty level is incredibly high. So going into our first form of tracking, which is radio telemetry. So this is what I'm going to be spending most of today on talking about radio telemetry, because this is one of the main ways that we do track bats. Uh, so radio telemetry uses radio signals. They are invisible, silent electromagnetic waves. There's radio waves occurring around us all of the time. That's why we can listen to the radio. Uh, so it's working in a very similar way, but we're applying it uh, to finding wildlife. So it comes in, we have three different parts when it comes to radio telemetry. We have the transmitter, we have the antenna, and we have the receiver. Uh, and so I have this schematic. This is a, um, a fish example, but I really liked that it demonstrated uh, all three of these pieces that we need, as well as highlighting the fact that you can do radio telemetry on multiple fronts. You can do it on the ground, in this case, ice. You can do it uh, in vehicles. So you can do it in, I've done radio telemetry in boats. I've also done radio telemetry in cars. And you can do aerial tracking as well. Uh, so lots of different ways that we can do radio telemetry. The transmitter is going to be on the animal. Uh, so for our bats, those are going to be on their backs, and I'll have lots of pictures of those. For this one, the little fish has its transmitter here. And we pick up that uh, each one of those transmitters is going to have a specific radio signal. And so we tune in our receiver to that specific signal and use our antenna to triangulate. So this is what the tags look like for our little bats. Um, so they are incredibly, incredibly small. This is on a Northern long-eared bat. And 
Uh, the tags themselves are not too horribly expensive. So this is one of the reasons why radio telemetry is, is usually a pretty good go-to is because each one of those tags are, are only going to be about $100 to $200, which really is not bad, especially when you start comparing it to things like our GPS tags, which can get, uh, depending on the size of them, um, can get very expensive very quickly. Uh, it's the antenna and the receiver that are going to probably be the most expensive part of this setup. But what's great about receivers and, and antennas is that those are going to be usable for an indefinite amount of time. Um, I've, I've been using, uh, there were some receivers and antennas that I used that were, um, you know, a couple of decades old and they still worked just fine. So they really hold up. Of course, newer technology is going to be shiny and new and wonderful, but the technology, even if it's a little bit older, is going to maintain its value and maintain its workability. Uh, and the tags themselves are, again, pretty cost effective because you can, you can collect the tags again and reuse them. Now, whether or not you can find the tag again is a whole other story, uh, but it is doable. So most of the time when we attach these radio telemetry tags, um, we're gonna be using a, a temporary skin adhesive glue, a surgical glue. That way, as the fur on the bat grows back, because we trim a little, we give them a little haircut, we give them a little hair trim, and we put that glue on their back. And as that fur grows out, they will slough off the transmitter, usually within a week or two. And if the battery life is still high enough, we can actually track down the tag and find it. So um, this, is, this is one of my very odd skills that I don't know why. I have a, a pretty good record of being able to find sloughed off tags, but I can't there's probably only a handful of times where I haven't been able to retrieve uh, retrieve tags that have been sloughed off by bats. So that's one of my fun little little uh, hidden skills there, I guess. Uh, it can be pretty tricky though, because when they slough off these tags, they're either stuck in tree crevices or they have fallen onto the forest floor. So uh, you, it's kind of a game of of I don't know, search and find. Uh, so it's like a little scavenger hunt and it can get pretty difficult, but it's fun. So I'm going to take us through a series of stories here. And these are uh, my own, per these are actual real example stories because these are projects that I have personally worked on. Uh, and so this is just to kind of take us through the process of what it's like to go through capturing a bat and then tracking it down and recording some characteristics of, of what we find uh, based off of the process of going through tracking down and using radio telemetry to find these bats. Uh, so this particular project was done in Missouri and Illinois. And this was looking for endangered Indiana bats. Uh, so these are actually a critically endangered species within the United States. And they're very small. They're a myotis species. So their scientific name is myotis sodalis. They are um, found mostly in the Eastern United States. And sadly, they are one of the species that has been, they were already uh, endangered before white nose syndrome came into the United States. And then after white nose syndrome, um, it, it, it devastated their population even more. So this project was a really, really uh, important one for me to be working on personally as an early career bat biologist. So this project, we captured this Indiana bat um, close to uh, close to the riverside, and we were wanting to track them down to uh, maternity colonies. Uh, so while this is a real life example, I have changed these uh, coordinates that I've put here on the maps because I didn't actually want to take us to real life critically endangered Indiana bat maternity colonies. So I am going to preface that. This is a real example, but I've changed the GPS coordinates. Uh, yeah, so we wanted to find out a lot about their maternity roosts. So we caught this particular bat. We did that process where we trimmed her back. We put a little bit of that surgical glue on there and we used those radio telemetry tags to track her down. Uh, so this is the actual, uh, pro the, this is an actual photo of us looking for this specific bat, which I, I'm kind of glad that I'm such obsessive picture taker because I can actually go back and do this kind of thing. So we caught this bat. Uh, down here near near this uh, the southern end, and then the signal was caught. This is about one kilometer away, so it wasn't too far. 
and we are up on a hilltop and we were able to pick up her signal uh, from this spot and we took a bearing. So we, when you take a bearing, you usually wanna have some kind of compass mechanism within your hand. You have your antenna in hand uh, like Cheyenne does here. And you wanna get the closest, you look for the strongest signal of B. So whenever you have your receiver in hand, there's actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play it a little bit here, where when you are listening to this receiver, it sounds very much like white noise. So hopefully you can hear this. So that's just static. That's just static. And that's most of the time what you're gonna be hearing when you are doing radio telemetry. However, we picked up that signal on that hilltop. And when we picked up that signal, you hear the glorious, glorious little beep. And when you hear that beep, the strongest, strongest beep sound that you can, it's when you take your bearing. And that's going to hopefully be uh, the strongest signal, which means it's going to be the most accurate in the direction of where your animal is going to be. However, you can't just take one signal. One signal only is going to give you a relative direction. You're going to want to take multiple signals and use the process of triangulation. So then we did that again. We went down a little bit further. You can't tell what the landscape is like here, but we went down this hill and we took another bearing in order to uh, try and narrow down where this bat was going to be. And then we wanted to do that a third time to try and really pinpoint where that bat is most likely. And that's when we started getting on foot and hiking around uh, to this general location to, in order to try and find our bat. And it's always really, 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 um, it's a very uh, heartwarming, I don't know, very proud moment when you go to your triangulated point and you actually find exactly what you're looking for. So I'm gonna take this picture away uh, because we did narrow it down to this stand of trees. And a little bit about Indiana bats. Indiana bats are incredibly, incredibly specific about what they need in a maternity colony. Female Indiana bats, um, the majority of the times are going to be highly selective for uh, snacks. So dead trees, so pretty aged dead trees with lots of bark coming off of the sides. And they will roost underneath that bark and they wanna have a lot of solar exposure because they like to be roasty toasty and the, their pups like to be nice and roasty toasty. Uh, so when we narrowed down through triangulation, we hiked it in on foot, we came across this stand of trees at our triangulated point. And this stand of trees was filled with hundreds of dead trees, snags with, with lots of bark coming off and all of them with high solar exposure. So at this point, we actually had to go through the entire process of triangulation all over again but this time at a smaller scale so that we could figure out the specific tree that that bat went to using its radio telemetry tag. And we did. We successfully found um, the correct tree within the snack, pardon me, within the snag of trees. We stayed out for the rest of the night and lo and behold, it was our tagged bat along with uh, dozens of other Indiana bats that emerged from the specific tree that we tracked it down to. Uh, so. Uh, radio telemetry is one of those like really high reward types of field techniques too, because there's, it's either you absolutely found the right thing or you didn't. And in this case, uh, we absolutely found the right thing. So that was a very exciting project. Okay, I'm gonna take us through another example here, but I wanted to take us through this because um, this was a really good project that I worked on where I had to take something else into consideration. So this is gonna be, um, this is kind of what it looked like looking at maps from above, but something that I want us to consider with this project is, is more of the landscape. So now I am taking us into West Virginia. So this is in the Northeastern United States and we are in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. So something that's happening here is that we are in a much more mountainous and hilly landscape. 
Uh, so I know you can't necessarily tell a lot about depth, but this down here is a tiny little barn. Well, actually that's a pretty big barn. And then we have a house down here. So you can get kind of understand an idea of just how dramatic uh, this landscape is going to be. This is really going to affect our abilities with radio telemetry. And I'll kind of go into why. Okay, so this project we were working on um, at the time, this, this species was listed as threatened. So this is the Northern long-eared bat, North, uh, Myotis septentrionalis. And uh, I was working on a project in West Virginia where we were similar with our Indiana bats, uh, attaching uh, radio telemetry tags to Northern long-eared bats and tracking them down to maternity colony roost trees. Uh, so this is just kind of the process of attaching a tag. So there's me giving that bat its little, its little trim, little haircut. Here's the radio telemetry tag off to the side and attaching it with that skin glue. And then there we go. We are ready to go and be tracked. So for this bat, we um, tracked it down. We were able to pick up a signal high up on a ridge line. And when we picked up that signal, it took us into uh, into this valley. So you can't tell much about the landscape here, um, but this is up on a hill ridge where the signal was detected. And this down here is, is much lower in elevation. So this is a hilltop, this is a hilltop, but this is very, very low. So the signal was coming from uh, the direction of the other hillside. So we went down, we went down uh, to this valley area and we took another bearing. This bearing, however, again, using that compass and getting a direction, a 360 degree direction, it did not align with our other signal at all. So we decided to go ahead and take another bearing. That bearing did intersect. And so we were a little confused as to where these multiple signals were coming from. And so we decided to continue with our triangulation process and just kind of hope for the best. We walked a little bit more inward into this valley and took another signal. And we were able to triangulate to this specific point. We did hike in at that point when we actually did discover that that is where the maternity roost for that bat was located. So we did again, yet again, successfully track down this particular bat. But in that case, what was with this signal? What was with this random signal, strong signal that was coming from practically the opposite direction of the roost tree itself? Well, if we take into consideration the landscape again, what we were experiencing was something that happens pretty often in radio telemetry when you have more dynamic landscapes, which is signal bounce. So again, we are, we are picking up radio signals. These are actual radio waves. Waves, no matter what, are going to bounce off of things. Sound waves bounce off of things. Light waves bounce off of things. Well, radio waves are exactly the same. Radio signals can bounce. And this particular landscape was mountainous and hilly enough that the signal was bouncing off the opposite hillside and we were picking it up in a strong, uh, in a very strong way, um, just in the opposite direction. Uh, so I kind of wanted to throw this example in there to kind of show that there's, there's, this is why it's kind of an art form is because you are going to have to consider lots of different variables about your environment, about your landscape and about your animal. Uh, so there's lots of things to consider as you're going through the telemetry process. Okay, so now I'm going to take us through uh, another uh, fun story. So I only have uh, pictures from here on out, sadly. Um, but this particular story is a really fun example of using radio telemetry on the ground. Uh, this was a particular project that I worked on in southern Missouri studying endangered gray bats. And for this particular project, the goal of this project was try to uh, what they call active tracking. So we were actively tracking gray bats to try and narrow down where a large maternity cave was located. So gray bats are cave obligate species. Many bat species will, will go from caves to trees, only be in trees, only be in caves. Um, gray bats are the type of species that are cave obligates. So you're only ever going to find them in caves. And 
once a bat enters a cave, the radio signals are very difficult to find. So we, in fact, practically impossible to find. They can't penetrate that rock. So uh, we wanted to actively track them because we couldn't track them in the daytime. They would be in a cave. So we, uh, it was actually, uh, um, this was a, another pr kind of proud moment of mine is because um, <laughs> We wanted to attach radio transmitters either on adult females or on juveniles, um, including juvenile males. So even though bats oftentimes will separate between the species during uh, during particular times of the year, we still wanted to put tags on juvenile males because they would be a part of the maternity colony because they were born that year. They're still with mom. So they would still take us back to mom. And we had three different radio telemetry tags out. And then it was my my last night of netting. It was the it was one o'clock in the morning, which is right around the time when we were told to be packing our stuff in. And I go to check my nets the very the very last time. And of course, what do I have in my net? But a juvenile gray bat. And so here we go. Uh, went and got this little critter out of the net as carefully and gently as I could, gave that bat a little trim, put, smacked that radio uh, telemetry tag on there, and then started tracking. And this was the form of active tracking. And what that means is we were in our cars. We were in our cars and we, we very much, if anyone has ever, um, like a, <laughs> watch the red green show or anything where duct tape can fix anything. We very much had to craft these holders on our vehicles, lots of tape, lots of duct tape, lots of zip ties holding these things on. And we were able to put our antennas onto our cars while we also had antennas holding with our hands outside of our cars. Of course, not the person driving because they are focused on the road, but we were in teams. And so we were using these antennas in our vehicles in the middle of the night, in the middle of rural Missouri, going up and down all of these gravel and dirt roads, finding and tracking, actively tracking these gray bats as they were foraging across the landscape. And it was up to us to communicate through phones and through and walkie talkies to communicate with each other. We have the signal over here. Okay, we have the signal over here. Okay, so let's triangulate together at the same time. Okay, the bat is probably over here. Let's keep driving and going. And that process lasted all the way until dawn. And we successfully tracked that bat back to a known one of the largest known maternity caves in all of Southern Missouri. Uh, so that was just a, a really incredible experience. And it was a new experience of radio telemetry for me because I have never, I, this was the first time I had ever done active radio telemetry tracking. Uh, so some really fun ways that we can do this as well, working in teams, working in cars, et cetera. So now I'm gonna spend, uh, now that we've kind of gone over how we do radio telemetry, I want to spend a lot of time on the, the cool questions that we can start answering and the cool um, ecological characteristics of these species that we can start finding out because of radio telemetry. Uh, so when it comes to roosting, so think different things about roosting that we can answer with uh, radio telemetry. So this example is about the Eastern red bat. And uh, this paper that was put out uh, a number of years ago, Winter Roosting Ecology of Eastern Red Bats in Southwest Missouri. This was a radio telemetry project to understand where these Eastern Red Bats were going in the winter. And what has been discovered over the last, uh, maybe just a, a dec, uh, I guess a little over a decade now, 10, 15 years or so, was when we found out because of telemetry work that Eastern Red Bats are actually, when temperatures get below a certain threshold, they will abandon their tree roosts and go underneath the leaf litter. So they will, they will hibernate underneath the leaves of southwestern Missouri forests in the temperate forests of Missouri uh, and further in the United States uh, underneath the leaf litter to stay warmer. Uh, all of that was discovered because of radio telemetry when all of a sudden, you know, the, the telemetry tag, they're detecting it in trees, goes to the ground. Maybe what was initially thought was, oh, I guess this bat dropped its tag, but no, 
No, once they started going to look for it, they found that the tag was actually still attached to the bat and it was the bat itself that was underneath the leaf litter. This can be further expanded into even more, uh, I don't wanna say even more interesting research, but it can expand the research and expand our knowledge into applicable studies. Uh, so this was actually a paper that I got to be a part of that stemmed from this initial research, uh, Eastern red bat responses to fire during winter torpor. Something that's very common in many forests within the United States are things like uh, fires. Fires are a normal part of natural habitats, natural ecosystems, but we also do controlled burns. So if we have bats that are on the ground in the winter time, are they going to be able to respond to threats such as a fire coming through? Um, and so we, we were able to find out that bats actually do respond to fire and they will, they will rouse from hibernation in order to avoid an incoming fire. But that type of really cool finding wouldn't have been possible if we didn't know that the bats were on the forest floor to begin with. Uh, some other cool things. We can look at things like colony dynamics. So bat, uh, bat colonies are, are very uh, interesting. Like every bat species is going to have a different, a different um, makeup of what their colonies are going to be like. Some colonies are only a few individuals. Other colonies can be upwards of millions of individuals. Uh, so we, we need to know a lot about colony Col bat colonies and the dynamics within those colonies in order to help us understand the species in general. Uh, so for this particular example, this was with uh, one of North America's most common bat species, the big brown bat, Aptesicus fuscus, roost switching, roost sharing, social cohesion of uh, big brown bats. Uh, conform to the fission fusion model. So what is fission fusion modeling? What this study did is that it used radio telemetry. So again, same methods that we've been talking about, but in this context, they tracked the bats every single day to see how they were moving from one colony to the other. And it turned out that the big brown bat actually has a much larger colony than just a single tree. It's actually a group of trees. And the individuals within each one of those trees is going to be moving from one tree to the other, having social relationships with every other bat within those few trees. Uh, and that is called a fission fusion model, where the colony kind of breaks up, breaks up a little bit into smaller colonies, but then comes back together. And then we can expand that study and look at the genetics between that kind of colony dynamic. So genetic relationships between roost mates in fission fusion societies. Uh, so again, it's taking that initial research using the radio telemetry to understand that this colony is actually much more dynamic than just a single tree, and then try to understand, okay, well, do the genetics, does relatedness, do moms stay with pups? Do pups uh, stay with their parents? Do parents stay with their siblings? Uh, we can start answering those types of questions. For this particular species, it turns out that it did not matter. Uh, social relationships were not determined by their genetics. Uh, so still interesting findings. Okay, so I kind of mentioned earlier uh, that we can start answering things about thermoregulation as well. And again, kind of breaking apart that word thermo thermoregulation. Um, this is about maintaining body temperature. And again, bats are, are incredible animals, unlike, uh, unlike most other animals um, on our planet. They have this amazing ability uh, for hibernation, um, some pretty incredible hibernation. Uh, so for this particular project, this was all about wanting to track hoary bats, which are a highly migratory species. And something that I want to note about hoary bats is that they are not considered to be much of a hibernating bat species. Up until probably quite recently, they were considered to, to be non-hibernating, um, which I would, I would personally argue that point. Um, so the point of this initial study was to understand their roosting habitats and where they were going and what they were relying on, but they used a different type of radio telemetry tag. They used a type of radio telemetry tag that also has the ability to measure skin temperature. 
Um, and skin temperature has been supported before to give us an understanding of hibernation within bat species. Um, but that's not, that's not part of this talk. We already know that that is an ability for these tags, um, but that's not necessarily what they were going to be looking for. But when they tracked down these bats, there was um, about a very, very, very poor cold weather. And when these hoary bats arrived at this location, they are getting ready to have their pups. They are pregnant females. So they are in a very uh, stressful physiological state already. And then they arrived at their summering grounds after migration. And then all of a sudden there was a big cold front uh, and they had to deal with that. I mean, they have no choice. They have to deal with that. They already had their telemetry tags, but when they tracked them down and collected the data, they found something incredibly interesting. That when they were when they looked at the data, these hoary bats entered hibernation for a number of days, correlating specifically with that incredibly cold uh, cold front or incredibly um, taxing cold front that came through. So I know I have this uh, a figure here on the right hand side. And uh, we don't have to understand this completely. The solid line, the solid lighter line is our ambient outside temperature. Uh, so this is in degrees Celsius. So it's not like it got like super below freezing or anything, but we're right above freezing. And this is pretty cold for this time of year and cold for these species. Uh, so pretty, pretty cold ambient temperature, outside temperature. And then the dotted line, this is the skin temperature of our hoary bats. So that radio telemetry tag was able to measure a skin temperature pretty regularly through this entire time frame. And we can see that as that ambient temperature drops, the skin temperature of that hoary bat drops and it enters this state of what they're calling prolonged torpor um, or hibernation by a pregnant free ranging hoary bat. Uh, so just some really incredible um, physiological information that we can find out because of radio telemetry. We can also find out things about migrations. So this was um, uh, this is about the, those Indiana bats again, Myotis sodalis, and their spring migration behavior. This paper was so comprehensive. Um, I thought it was uh, an incredibly uh, interesting and well done piece of research. Um, by Pi Piper Roby and uh, et al. So a lot of really interesting things happening here. They, they had nine years worth of, of radio telemetry data, not just from tracking on the ground, but they were also doing active tracking in vehicles and they were doing aerial tracking in airplanes um, all the way from their overwintering caves, tracking them down to different staging trees, going all the way to their summer maternity uh, colonies. So it was just a very comprehensive, all-encompassing, lots of incredible, lots of labor work to understand the spring migrations of this critically endangered species. Uh, so migration, we can start finding out a lot of things about migration. Um, but I did want to emphasize short migrations here because I do want to emphasize again that when it comes to radio telemetry, we have the limitation of battery life. So it's not like we're going to be able to measure a migration that consists of weeks or months uh, with something like a radio telemetry tag. But we can look at other things about migration, such as migration behaviors. Uh, so one of uh, this is actually one of my favorite papers, just because I am I'm constant. One of my favorite fields is perception. I'm 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 I find perception and the ability to try and understand how different animals sense their environments is just something that absolutely thrills me uh, in a scientific way. Uh, so this is all about um, a, a highly migratory species in Europe. This, this work is done by Dr. Oliver Lindecki um, and, and the group that works over there, mostly located around Germany, some really incredible migration behavior work coming out of Europe. Uh, and they used radio telemetry to look at things at like uh, migration behavior and how bats are using different things in their environment to orient themselves for migration. Because determining direction, understanding which way you need to go is very important when you're a migratory species. Uh, so for this one, they looked at polarized light. 
Uh, so polarized light in this case did not uh, calibrate the compass system of a migratory bat. Uh, so they were not using polarized light. And I think, oh, no, nope, I did not update uh, this particular one, but there was actually kind of an update to this uh, paper. And what they were doing is they used radio telemetry. They trimmed the fur off the bat. They put that radio telemetry tag on the bat and they exposed different groups of bats to different environmental cues. Cause we can actually mimic, we can mimic um, which direction the sun is going to be coming from or which way we are sensing polarized light. Uh, and so they had the control, which is the natural setting. And then they had um, an experimental group where they got like a reverse exposure of where that light was coming from. And they released the bats and used the radio telemetry equipment to take a bearing up until the point the bat disappears. And then that was determined as the intentional direction that that bat was orienting to. It's important to note here as well, while the polarized light did not influence a difference between the control and the experimental group, which is what we see here. What we also see here is, is that the bats are still selectively choosing, selectively flying in a specific direction but we just haven't answered quite answered the question as to how they're able to do that yet. Uh, so again, more research to come. Um, I'm just going to skip because hey, I know we're a little bit short on time. So I'm going to go ahead and go uh, into GPS tracking. Uh, so GPS tracking, this is going to be even more fine tuned, fine scale. It's using the global positioning system, which is a part of uh, GNSS or the global navigation satellite system. So this is very accurate geolocation time information. We know exactly where you were, when you were there, um, and we can also get a Z scale as well. So we can actually say, uh, this is where you are on the X, Y axis. So where you are on the earth, but then also where in the atmosphere you were positioned. So lots of really neat information. But bats make it difficult again. Many of them are too small. We have much more micro bats. Bats are not recaptured very often. Uh, so for example, uh, yes, you can recapture bats. I recaptured this particular bat. I recaptured this bat 28 years later in a mist net, not from, not from being able to be tracked, but because of this band. Uh, so bats are very difficult to recapture. But when we can use GPS tracking, we can answer really cool questions um, including things about homing. So for this particular example, this is the Egyptian fruit bat, and they were able to show that even when these Egyptian fruit bats are displaced far away from their home tree and their home cave, even in the middle of a crater, they are able to correct themselves, figure out where they are in the environment, and then make it back to their home tree and home cave. Similarly, uh, they were able to find out that this bat species, um, I, I was a little, uh, I saw this, they use the word astonishing here, which is kind of an inflammatory word to use in a scientific paper there. But when I looked at their results, it turned out that this particular bat species, because of GPS, GPS tracking, uh, was able to move over 100 kilometers in a single evening to its foraging location, which really is quite astonishing. And then we can also discover things such as breeding behaviors. So the, the hammerhead bat, the hammerhead fruit bat exhibits a breeding behavior called lecking where the males compete with each other and have, um, frankly, they have honk offs. So they make this very, this very loud honking noise and that is the display of the male. And the males will find out who the best honker is and, uh, and then he gets to have a very, very successful reproductive year. Uh, so that is called lecking. And we found that out because of using things like GPS tracking, which took us to the actual lek itself. Uh, so really, really incredible uh, research there done by, by Sarah Olson, uh, uh, finding out the, the lek movement associated, association with our hammerhead bats. Uh, and I do want to emphasize that the reason why GPS tracking works in these cases, these last couple of examples that I've used here, is because these species have pretty good site fidelity, which means that we can get these tags back. GPS tracking does not really work 
if you can't get your GPS tags back. Um, it also worked in, in a single case for our hoary bats as well, where a male, where males continuously came back to the same location year after year, and they were able to recapture a single, or I think either one to three individuals, it was something around there. I think it might've been three individuals that they were able to capture. And they were able to record a thousand kilometer circular migration and hibernation yet again within our hoary bats. So that's some incredible work and in improving technology with our hoary bats, our, our North American migratory bats. Then we have something um, a, little, a little less like GPS tracking, a little less like radio telemetry, um, pit tagging. Pit tagging is referring to passive integrative transponders. So they're just like the little tags that we have in our cats and our dogs to ID them. Um, and they're very small, they're unique ID codes. There's no battery and they're very inexpensive. A pit tag is only gonna cost you about a dollar. So they're very, very inexpensive. So if we see here, this is a tiny little pit tag in relation to a small myota species. So they're quite small. And we can use these pit tags. All these pit tags do is that they get scanned and it tells us this individual was here at this time. So you have to have a scanner and you have to have an animal with the pit tag. But we can start answering questions about roosting. Um, we can look at things like information transfer. So they had these uh, boxes in multiple different roosts, and they had some in, in ideal, and they had favorable roosting trees, and then they had unfavorable roosting trees. And they were actually able to demonstrate through pit tagging that the information of which ones were favorable and which ones were not was transferred from box to box to box by the use of these pit tags. Uh, so, and then there's like there's updates to that as well, again, looking at things like relatedness once again. Uh, this is a type of research that I'm personally uh, implementing right now at my own field site, trying to use a passive monitoring system using pit tags to understand bat movement in the context of foraging. So these large antennas that you see over the creek here are the pit tag scanners. And the idea is that bats will fly through and we can get an idea of how they're moving through the ecosystem. And this is just to kind of split that apart uh, into um, all of the different methods and how, how we're using this particular system. Then we have things like the MODIS tower. So this is kind of going back to radio telemetry, but this is large scale stationary antennas. It's an automated digital radio telemetry array, and it's very collaborative. Any researcher can tune into the MODIS towers. We can all buy access to our MODIS tags and start deploying these. This is the current spread of MODIS towers across the entire globe. So there is currently a pretty strong bias to the Western hemisphere. And even within the Western hemisphere, there's this pretty strong bias for uh, the Eastern United States. But what is really exciting is that um, there's been a, a huge collaborative project between Manitoba and Saskatchewan. And there's actually about to be a lot more new MODIS towers being put up and what we can do with our MODIS towers is that with our MODIS tags, we can start um, as these bats are moving with these tags. And this is mostly going to be answered questions about migration because these towers can't move. They can't get in a car or an airplane or on the ground and start tracking bats. They're stationary. So the idea is, is that the MODIS towers are stationary. The tags are on the volant animals. And as they are flying and along their migration routes, they are pinging the MODIS towers as they are moving across the landscape. And we've already started implementing using this type of technology, answering questions about migratory species and how they use different sites for stopovers and refueling. And again, this type of technology is expanding to help us understand the, uh, the endangered little brown myotas. Uh, but it's not always about where they go, but also how they do it. So we have some really other cool tracking technologies. So it's not just about tracking animals to where they live, but also tracking animals in live time to understand how they're interacting with their environment. So we have things like thermal technology and thermal tracking technology can help us understand conservation issues, such as how bats are behaving at wind turbines. If we understand how bats are interacting with these turbines, maybe we can understand better ways to avoid um, collision with wind turbines during migration. 
Uh, we can also do uh, different ways of detecting of large colonies of abundance. It's very hard to count bats in big colonies, but now we can use thermal technology with things like drones. And a quote from this paper, from uh, Elaine McCarthy's uh, research paper, that they, they can now accurately reflect the true abundance of flying foxes using thermal tracking technology. So pretty interesting stuff here. And then think about wings. Just think about wings in general. We have insect, this is an insect wing diagram, bird wing diagram. This is a pterosaur and this is a bat. And something that whenever I saw this image, I was like, wow, bat wings out of all of these, these are all of the taxa that have independently evolved flight. And it's the bat wing that is just so much more dynamic. There's so many more points of torsion, so many more uh, appendages going through the wing. So they're very, they just have a completely different way of flying. And now we can use um, newer types of technology to actually track how bat wings are moving, changing shape and, um, and interacting with the air itself to understand aerodynamics of bat flight, um, which there's all sorts of different applications. The more we understand about wildlife, the more we can understand ways that we can, um, I don't know, use, use them in our, our everyday world. You know, like there's, there's many different applications of wildlife um, facts that we use in our, in our lives. So there's all sorts of really incredible technologies, not just about finding animals, but tracking different aspects of the animals themselves. Uh, so with that, I would just like to say uh, thank you again to GBATnet for putting this on today. I didn't leave too much time for questions, so sorry for taking uh, a little too much time. Uh, but thank you everyone for coming in today. Uh, again, you can find me on social medias as well as uh, GBATnet as well. And with that, I, I would like to take any questions if there are any. Thanks, Dana. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Feel free to type in the chat or raise your hand. Great. So in the chat, uh, Esteban asks, uh, such a great talk. I was wondering, is it difficult to get wildlife conservation focusing on bats jobs outside of postgraduate programs in academia? <laughs> I think that's a much longer. That, that that's is a much, much uh, that's a, a dense question. Um, let's see outside of postgraduate? I mean, I would say so. There's all sorts of, I mean, it, it, it might not be specifically centered around bats because a lot of times in those different jobs, you're probably gonna be working with other wildlife too. But there's, there's government jobs that you can get. There's lots of jobs in industry. Um, yeah, so there's, there is plenty of work out there that's outside of academia. Uh, in fact, uh, some of those papers that I referenced, um, the ones that have, um, there's, there were multiple papers that I referenced that were actually produced by people working uh, in industry and government, not necessarily in academia. Uh, so you can also actively be publishing research and do research outside of academia and graduate school as well. Uh, yeah. Are there any questions? Uh, Hirathon asks, what is the range of the detection of pit tag scanners in your field experiments? I was curious how far they can detect tags. Yeah, uh, so my particular one, that's actually something that I've been playing with because um, I'm using this, my pit tag system is very different from how it's been implemented in the past. Uh, so currently I have an incredibly large gauge copper wire and the detection range is about um, one meter above and below. So the entire range within my particular antenna is two meters within that space. And so between the bottom wire and the top wire, each one of those is providing a meter of coverage. So in total within the antenna, it's completely covered two meters worth of coverage and then a meter above and a meter below. However, we've been having technical difficulties, so. <laughs> uh, Diego asked, do you know of vampire bat tracking experiences? 
Um, I, I know that there's been, there's been so much cool work done on vampire bats. And in fact, I started to try and find examples of that one, but there's actually just, it gets dense pretty quickly because of how, how insanely incredible the, uh, social groups of vampire bats are, uh, telemetry, uh, tagging has been used for vampire bats to understand these social relationships. Uh, so it has been, it has been used. Um, I haven't personally, personally worked on that, but if you want to look up some really, really, really cool, cool research, I highly recommend you look into the work of Dr. Gerald Carter. Um, so please go look into that because there's lots of really cool information about vampire bat sociality, uh, et cetera. So lots of, lots of really neat things there. Uh, Teresa also mentions that there is going to be some pit tag work that she'll be publishing soon uh, on Leptonicris uh, yerba uh, Varsha asks, how long does it take for you to locate a bat through triangulation? Are there always many people with uh, antennas and receiver tracking bats at the same time? Uh, so that really, how long it takes, very, it, it depends. There's some bats that you never find. Like that's just, that that happens. So I don't want to say so, so often. It does not happen so, so often. But some bats just leave. Some bats just leave and you don't see them again. Other bats, you can pick up the signal, but the landscape itself is so inaccessible that you, you can have a hard time finding them. Uh, so uh, it very much, it depends. It depends on the landscape. It depends on where you are. It depends on what you're studying. So some bats you'll never find. Some bats can take a full week. Some bats you can find the next day. So all depends. Uh, Nicholas asks, with respect to the 5% rule, how strict is it? I'll be tracking vampire bats this year for my PhD. However, most tags I've noticed would be between 7 and 9% body weight of healthy bats, at least with respect to the average body weight of bats here. So, um, in there. You know, for the work that I have, per I can't speak to vampire bats because I don't know the rules and regulations there. For my personal experience when it comes to tracking bats. I have had it strictly said to me that we need to stick to the 5% rule. Um, there's been re more recent pushback regarding the 5% rule because it's not necessarily the case. Like it's not necessarily that, that they're not going to be able to fly with anything heavier, especially when you consider that a, a mother bat, including small bats, like a little brown myotis mom still has to be capable of potentially picking up and carrying her pup with her, which weighs much heavier than a radio telemetry tag. Uh, granted, they're going to be carrying a telemetry tag for a lot longer than they would be carrying a pup. So I think that that's probably a conversation that you're going to have to have with your supervisor, with your, or your, um, if you're at a university, um, with your animal care committee if your university has one because they might they might have rules in place so i think it that depends on where you are it's not an official rule it's just kind of this unofficial stance that's been around for for a long time yeah and, uh, hi, this is a wonderful talk i think this is quite helpful for a lot of us who are working on batch um, so some of my questions have already been answered uh, my ask is is it possible for you to share uh, with the group here on the manufacturers, basically, whether it's a tip tag or the GPS trackers, uh, who are the manufacturers that we can approach for and uh, probably the estimated cost you can know of? Hmm. I know um, I really like using uh, Hollow Hill okay, tag. Yeah. I've always had really good experiences working with Hollow Hill, and I've also been using Low Tech. When it comes to pit tagging and at least one, the antenna systems that I've been working with, I've never used GPS tagging because the bats that I work with, it I have never been able to even consider using GPS tags really. Um, for pit tagging, I, I work with Oregon RFID and they are incredibly helpful. They're a very helpful company. So if you're ever considering using something like pit tagging, I highly recommend them. They have incredible systems and their technical support is second to none. They are um, probably the best company I've ever worked with in, in that context. 
Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, with pip tax, I think um, the only objective could be to kind of see whether moving back to the same cave or same bat uh, goes, right? Uh, you can't really track the movement or uh, get the GPS location unless you have uh, placed the antenna in different places. Again, the limitation of one meter or two meter detection. Yeah, uh, so you need yeah you need to have stationary antennas set up, and and the only reason why like my particular system works is because for some reason the bats the bats kind of use this creek this little river as okay. uh, as like a a little flyway. And so it works, it works in my system that I can have the ability to look at movement and how they're moving through the landscape using something like pit tagging. Um, otherwise, yes, you're correct. You'd have to use something like GPS tracking or radio or active radio telemetry tracking, which can get dicey at night. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Sorry, I have one last question. Um, I saw the tag, which is uh, tagged to the hammerhead uh, back. Uh, yes. I, it's like it's a solar uh, powered uh, bag. Right. So, uh, was it a solar powered tag? Let me. It looks like it was solar powered. I don't know. I, what I can do, I can't say off the top of my head what uh -huh. the um, tag is, but what I can do. Oh, I thought I had the paper here. Uh, in the chat, oh, um, Hirathan said, yeah, yes, it's an EOP solar tag. Okay. okay. Great. I think uh, we you. have limited options to use uh, maybe the fruit bats in India. Okay. That's all yeah, for my side. Your bats, your bats have pretty good site fidelity. Like if they're going back to the same tree or they're going back to the same cave, then then using something like GPS tracking would, would definitely be an ideal situation uh, for you. Um, and especially yeah. if your bats are, are big enough. Yeah, we have a couple of options there, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and some comments related to that in the chat. Uh, Teresa mentioned that she's using biomark pit tags uh, and also that okay. there are EOP solar tags being used for Atropus Livingstonii. And there are actually a lot of folks who have worked on different flying foxes in uh, Asia that you know are slightly larger, have less of these weight limitations related to them um, that you can look into. So uh, Richard Alexi, uh, Natalia Weber, like a bunch of the published papers related to that as well. Yeah. Uh, and Nicholas mentioned that for GPS tags, he is using path track. Um, and if anyone, I, I don't know if anyone didn't have access to the papers that I referenced within within the, the talk, but if anyone wants access to papers, I can always send those to you, Susan, too. Yes, yeah, send them to me and I will make like a folder or something that everybody can download, I guess. Um, okay, we are a little over time and I have to run to another meeting also. I'm okay. going to stop recording. Thank you everybody for coming today and uh, join us next time for some more, some more cool research on bats. All right. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone.